Hello, my name is Martin Pike and welcome to this lecture from the Ada University course on programming in the large. The subject of this lecture is generic programming in Ada and together we shall complete a series of slides and then you will be assessed on your learning using some quiz questions. The subject of this lecture is centered on identifying patterns of logic within your program design and algorithms. It is possible to abstract an algorithm's implementation from details of the data types and utility subprograms that it uses to achieve its goals. In these example snippets, we see two procedures whose bodies are identical but differ only in their declarative part and parameter specifications. The art of generic programming involves determining where the abstractions can be safely made and packaging the algorithm into an instantiable template. A demonstration of this shows in the lower pseudocode snippet. The procedure body has been abstracted from the details of the data type it is operating on. This example could be compiled for either integers or boolean parameter types with no change to the actual procedure body. There are many names within the field of programming for this notion including patterns, generic or template based programming. The Ada programming language supports features designed to enable a programmer to code algorithms in a data abstracted way using what's called a generic unit. Ada source code in most cases uses the what you see is what you get principle, but generic Unix are an exception to this because they do not specifically exist at runtime in their source code form. A generic unit is a piece of code that must be instantiated by the developer in order for it to be usable at runtime. In essence, it is a runtime copy of the abstract generic units source code, whose life will be dictated by the parameters provided at its instantiation. This may be a difficult concept to initially, be, initially grasp, but if you spend the time to embrace these basics of the subject, then it will really revolutionize how you write code. Ada is not alone in supporting generic programming and you may or may not have come across the concept of templates in C++ which are similar. As an example of this we show following code snippet that has a comparison between specification instantiation and use of Ada generic units alongside that of a C++ template. Generic units can be made from subprograms or packages. There is a simple restriction that the children of generic units must also be generic in themselves. The top code snippet on this slide shows a generic package called parent with a parameter t and the parent.child package that is also identified as generic. The code then goes on to instantiate the parent and child generic packages. It's important to remember that each instantiation of a generic unit creates a completely new set of data and there is no connection between the data in one instance and that of another. To demonstrate this we use a generic package with a publicly available variable v. Each instance of p has created a distinct version of v in the space i1 and i2. The comparison operation will evaluate to true in this example because the assignment was made to two different areas of memory. Determining what parts of an algorithm can be made abstract, and
and turning them into generic parameters is a significant part of the learning of generic programming. The specification of the generic unit must provide a clear statement to the package user of how it can be parameterized at instantiation. This acts as a contract between the package user and the generic algorithm. The first code snippet here shows that the type T1 must have the properties of a private type and T2 must be unconstrained. Whichever actual parameters are provided in the generic unit instantiation, they must provide at least as many properties as that specified in the generic contract. The generic algorithm is relying on the package user to adhere to the contract and this is enforced by the ADA typing system at compilation. In turn, the generic algorithm must also adhere to the contract. The second code snippet here shows how the compiler has picked up that there is no constraint given when the type T has been used yet the specification of the generic contract states the type is unconstrained. The compiler and the ADA type system will ensure both the package user and the generic unit comply with the contract. The properties of any types in a generic contract provide vital information to the user and the compiler. Here we will look at the properties available to the generic unit author. First of all, it is possible to write a contract for a generic unit that requires private types, both non-limited simple and indefinite private types. For an explanation of the difference between simple and indefinite private types, please see the lesson on encapsulation in this series of lectures. It is also possible to specify a generic type with the properties of any discrete type, including integers and enumerations. There is also support for pure integers, floating point types and indeed access types. The code snippet at the bottom of this slide shows an example of a generic function that can be instantiated with any discrete type, for example an integer or a character. You may notice I have skipped over array types in this list. This requires a specific slide which will follow. It is possible to specify the array, its index and component types all in the generic units contract. This allows the generic contract to contain types that build on top of each other. In this example, we show a generic procedure called P. Its contract, first of all, contains a simple private type T, followed by a discrete type index. T is then used as the component type for the array type R, and index has been used for the array index. The example instantiates P as the procedure P underscore string and provides an integer for t, character for index, and the previously declared array type int array. The key point here to understand is the consistency of this layering will be checked by the compiler at compile time. I would also like to point out that using named parameters when instantiating generic units is particularly useful for ensuring the contract is adhered to. Now we've looked at generic types, we move on to variable parameters that can appear in a generic contract. First we'll look at variables that can use the same mode as parameters to a procedure or function, namely in, out and in, out. A constant can also be simulated using an in variable. These parameters provide a way for the generic unit to force the user to provide objects at instantiation rather than at call time if the unit is a function or procedure. 
like we have previously seen for array typed generic parameters, it is possible for generic variables to be typed using other generic typed parameters. In the example below, we see that P has a contract using a private type T, an integer, and an in out variable of the private type T. The compiler will ensure the variable x2 is of the same type as that specified for t when p is instantiated as pi in the code snippet below. Our final look at generic parameter types brings us to look at how subprograms can be used. A generic subprogram parameter must be defined in the generic contract and prefixed using the with reserved word. This is to ensure it is not confused with the generic unit name itself in case it is a generic subprogram unit like a function or procedure. Here we see an example of this with a generic procedure P that has a procedure called callback in its contract. The body of P may make calls to callback to complete its function. At instantiation of P, the subprogram something is provided as the generic parameter callback. It is possible to specify that defaults should be used if no parameter is specified at instantiation. The default can either be a subprogram matched by name or a null subprogram. The final example on this slide shows a default instantiation and how a matched subprogram has been found by the name for the default of callback1 and null has been used for the default of callback2. I would like to reiterate that the compiler is able to check the consistency of all aspects of the generic contract. We've now reached the end of the slide section of this lecture. You should now have enough knowledge of generic programming in ADA to complete a small quiz with questions designed to test your understanding. Good luck! Our first question starts off with the specification of a generic package G that has a private typed generic parameter named T. The procedure P attempts to instantiate G using integer as the formal parameter. Click on the tech icon if you believe the code is correct or the location of the code you suspect is wrong. The code is incorrect and will fail to compile for a number of reasons. First, the use clause cannot be made on a generic package G as there is no actual instance made yet. Secondly, V would not be directly visible because the instance I has no use clause. The next question uses the same specification of the generic package G as the previous question, but with a slightly different use within the procedure P. A type myInteger is derived from integer and used as the formal argument to instantiate G as the package I2 along with a plain integer being used to instantiate G as package I1. There are use clauses for both instantiations and if you think that the code is correct click on the tick icon otherwise click on the location of the code you suspect is wrong. This code is incorrect due to there being an unresolved ambiguity about from which package V is being referenced. The options to resolve the compilation error are to prefix V by the package name or type qualify the assigned value and allow the compiler to determine the package based on the type. Question 3 again uses the same specification of the generic package G. This time the procedure P 
doesn't include a use clause for the I1 instantiation of G with the type MyInteger. Click on the tick icon if you believe the code is correct or the location of the code you suspect is wrong. This time the code is correct and shall compile with no errors. The compiler is able to identify that V belongs to I1 as there is only a use clause for I1 and not one for I2. This means there is no ambiguity. This is only achievable by the strong typing model provided by the Ada programming language. The next question presents a new generic package specification P that has a read-write variable V in the contract and a publicly available integer variable V2 that is initialized with the value of the parameter at instantiation. Our procedure main attempts to instantiate P as the package I1 with the value 10 as the generic contract variable. Click on the tick icon if you believe the code is correct or the location of the code you suspect is wrong. The code is incorrect and will fail to compile. The specification of the generic package P states the variable V is in out and therefore any instantiations must ensure a read write variable is passed as the argument. The next question in, in the quiz uses a generic package G and a child generic package of G called child. Our procedure P instantiates the generic package G as I1 using an integer and then attempts to access the g.child package variable v. Click on the tick icon if you believe the code is correct or the location of the code you suspect is wrong. The code is incorrect and will result in a compilation error. A generic child package needs to be instantiated separately so for example we would need to instantiate child as child1 and then access the v variable. We now introduce a generic package with a specification that names the indefinite private type t in its generic contract. The procedure p instantiates g with an integer argument and then accesses the v variable from the package. Click on the tick icon if you believe the code is correct or the location of the code you suspect is wrong. The code is incorrect and will fail to compile due to t being an indefinite type so it must be constrained at the point of generic unit instantiation. Question 7 has a simple private type used as a generic parameter for the generic package G. T is used to type a public variable within instances of G. Our package P declares a private type called myType and uses it to instantiate the generic package G. The private section of P goes on to implement myType as a null record. Click on the tick icon if you believe the code is correct or the code you suspect is wrong. The code is incorrect. Compilation will fail with errors due to myType not being implemented at the point it is used to instantiate package G. A package is instantiated at the point of declaration. In this case we don't yet have the implementation of myType so the package cannot be instantiated. For the next question we define a generic procedure P to have a contract that requires a simple private type T at instantiation. 
A record type R is then declared along with an access type for each storage pool or stack. A series of instantiations of P take place with different arguments. Click on the tick icon if you believe the code is correct or the location of the code you suspect is wrong. There will be a compilation error with this code at compilation time because a string is an indefinite type and the generic contract for P states quite explicitly that a simple type is required. Our penultimate question uses a similar code snippet to the previous question except this time the generic contract for the procedure P states that an indefinite private type is required. A series of instantiations then take place. Click on the tick icon if you believe the code is correct or the location of the code you suspect is wrong. This code is OK and it will compile without any errors. The generic parameter T can accept both definite and indefinite types. Our last question of the quiz presents a generic package with no generic parameters but publicly declares a new type T with a range 0 through to 10. The main procedure makes two instantiations of P with the name I1 and I2 and then goes on to create two stack objects using the exposed type T from package I1 and I2. One of the objects is then assigned to the other. Click on the tick icon if you believe the code is correct or the location of the code you suspect is wrong. This code is faulty and will fail to compile. i1.t and i2.t are completely different distinct types and are not compatible with each other. In order to perform this assignment, a type conversion would be required. Thank you for attending this lecture on generic programming in ADA as part of the course of programming in the large using ADA. I hope you have found it a valuable step in learning the ADA programming language and that you continue on to the other lectures in the course from the ADA University. Thank you.